This program is a Warren Stiebel production in association with South Carolina ETV. Funding for Firing Line is made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated, and the Friends of Firing Line. <laughs> Once again, we look at the Israeli-Palestine uh, question, this, this time precipitated by the iron refusal of Prime Minister Netanyahu to agree to an accommodation uh, backed by the Clinton uh, administration. What has surprised many observers is the denunciation by the Israeli government of terms which, in the understanding of many, are highly favorable uh, to Israel. But let me stop here because our two guests are eloquent uh, advocates of conflicting opinions in the matter. <coughs> City Zion has twice before appeared on firing line to defend whatever was in the position of Israel on whatever matter. Mr. Zion is a graduate of the Yale Law School, a journalist formerly with the New York Times, now a syndicated columnist with the New York Daily News, and the author of several books. Uh, Henry Siegman is a senior fellow on the Middle East uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations and director of the Council's U.S. Middle East project back in 1994. Siegman was for many years executive director of the American Jewish Congress and editor of the quarterly Middle East Studies. He has written uh, extensively on the Middle East. Uh, early in April, Mr. Siegman wrote despondently that Netanyahu has all but destroyed the impetus of the Oslo Accords, that Labour opposition leader Ehud Barak has ineptly challenged the policies of Mr. Net Net Netanyahu. Which policies, Mr. Siegman warns, go so far as to endanger the strategic partnership between the United States and Israel. Let me begin by asking Mr. Siegman, what can be the motives of Netanyahu if your analysis of his policies is correct? Well, it is hard to say because in the current issue of uh, New Yorker magazine, David <coughs> bar -Ilan is quoted as saying that even he, one of uh, Netanyahu's closest aides, friends, and advisors, doesn't have a clue. But what seems clear, and that seemed clear to me at least even before that April piece, I wrote that as far back as a year and a half ago, that Netanyahu is incapable of making decisions. And whatever his long-range strategic vision may be, assuming he has one, it is something that he treats in eschatological terms. In terms of the immediate realities, his goal is to delay decisions and keep <coughs> delaying them and uh, allow the status quo to prevail without turning over, without changing the situation on the ground. But he has to explain his motives for what he does to, to, to his cabinet and to the people, right? Exactly. And those are two somewhat different explanations. Yeah. To his cabinet, which is heavily right-wing. Uh, <coughs> right-wing being intransigent? In terms of the peace process. Yeah. That is to say, they, he has elements in there that oppose any kind of concessions uh, to the Palestinians. He has, uh, uh, the settler movement is considered part of his, cons uh, he considers to be an important part of his uh, constituency. The formidable Sharon is uh, in his cabinet. More recently, he has reached out to the head of Tzomet, uh, an extreme right-wing group um, whose, whose uh, declared goal it is to transfer all Palestinians out of the West Bank. So these are the folks he considers to be his constituents. To them, he says openly or by wink or covertly, not to worry, because we will insist on reciprocity and on all kinds of conditions, which in the end the Palestinians will not be able to meet. To the public, to the general public, which includes a very substantial, very significant number of Israelis who do want to see the Oslo peace process succeed, he says, that's my objective. And at the point where Arafat cooperates, we'll achieve that objective. But in the meantime, don't expect me to accommodate this terrible man. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Zion, the <coughs> Mr. Siegman has pointed out that uh, uh, Netanyahu has almost regularly declined to attempt to um, talk with Arafat. 
Now, is this an ideological freeze, or is it a temperamental freeze? Well, look, I, I think that the, the, this whole entire program is a little bit misnomered um, here. We shouldn't be calling it the Netanyahu problem, though he is a problem. The real problem is Arafat. The real problem, and you mentioned the word reciprocity, as if to say, they can't do these things. Well, they promised to do these things. All of these things were worked out. We're going to get rid of the covenant to destroy Israel. We're going to get rid of the infrastructure of terror. We're going to do many, many things, all of which were considered quite important, sworn to, not once, but three times, Oslo 1, Oslo 2, Hebron again, all of these things. Everything Israel is now told they should do were conditioned on those things being done. None of them were done. Now, we're being told, you don't bother me with technicalities. I mean, the American people are being told the same thing by the administration. They won't say it that way because they just like avoid it. Oslo, Oslo was killed off by the Palestinians' refusal to abide by any of its particulars, any. Now what is this? It takes two to tango. But Israel is being told, no, we, America, the government, at least the Clintonites and the people in the State Department, which is the last and only permanent government in America, the Arabs in the State Department, whoever is president, and whatever promises they make, the minute they get in there, all they can see is the Palestinian state. Now, if you want an unconditional withdrawal by Israel, which is exactly what we want, say so. And the Israeli people will never buy it. Hang on. That's you're all it is. It's unconditional. Slow, slow They're not going to do anything. He just said they can't. Slow well, down, then why they promise it if they can't? <laughs> hang on. This is it. Okay. I, I want to ask Mr. Stephen to comment on your statement that the Oslo, that the people, the Palestinians, have made no, no, have not deferred in any particular to the Oslo agenda. Is that correct? No, in my view, that is not correct at all. In my view, both sides have violated the terms of Oslo. Well, in what way have but, they not violated? I, I will be okay. glad to tell you. Both, both, you sides, have, both <laughs> sides have violated. Uh, and indeed, those violations occurred early on. That is to say that even under Rabin, whom Arafat presumably <coughs> liked and uh, had uh, good relations with, uh, even then, Arafat violated some of the agreements, and as did Rabin. Rabin made it clear that there are no holy dates, he said, and the targets set in the Oslo Accord do not need to be observed, and that Israel will unilaterally decide uh, when it will meet its obligations. So early on, there were, there were problems on both sides. There's only one big difference. And incidentally, what Israel to this day has not observed, that has not established safe passage between Gaza and the West Bank, as uh, between uh, Gaza and the West Bank, as required by Oslo. It has not agreed to an airport. It has not agreed to a seaport. It has not released the prisoners, all of the prisoners that were supposed to release under the terms of Oslo. So there, and most important, Israel conti continues, I shouldn't say Israel, this government well. continues unilaterally to build settlements and to preempt the heart of the matter, which is what Oslo is all about, how, wait do, you, a minute, how do you divide these territories? You know very well that, th that the airport and all that stuff you mentioned were conditioned on them doing things, and they didn't Let's do Let's talk them. about that. So you don't have to. Let's talk about them. Well, I mean, this deal was yeah. over the minute even, even look, they, did they turn over one prisoner as required? They have a list of 30 murderers that many of them killed American you make people a, you make and would never turn point. one of them You make over. a valid point, let me address it. Why did they agree to it? That's a good point, okay. so let me, let, me, let me address that. Uh, first of all, the, um, the notion that they didn't observe any of the agreements is one that you will find the head of Israel Shin Bet, uh, that's Israel Security Service, totally disagrees with as of yesterday, the head of the IDF intelligence, whom incidentally I saw only two weeks ago and discussed this matter with, but publicly for the record, I even brought with me a statement issued by the consulate here, Israel's Digest, quoting Ayalon, saying that Palestinians are, Arafat is fighting terrorism and has been doing this now for a number of months and effectively. So that's the judgment of Israel's secret services. To say that he hasn't observed any of the, of the uh, conditions is simply not true. On the Palestinian covenant, which is constantly being dragged out as an example of uh, Arafat's violations, the fact of the matter is that when the PNC was convened in July of 66 and <coughs> voted clearly to delete from the covenant any reference 
which deals with destruction of the Jewish state. That formula was under the Rabin government, right? That formula was approved by the Rabin government before the, the motion was put to them and passed. And the reason the Rabin government was satisfied with that kind of a general formula, they didn't want them to begin rewriting a whole new covenant, which necessarily would have to address the issue of Palestinian statehood as well. And they preferred this. General, General uh, Shahor, who was the head until recently of the West Bank uh, uh, administration, made that point in <coughs> Haaretz, in Israel's, uh, uh, one of Israel's leading, in Ma'ariv, rather. You, one of so you're saying that they have done what Rabin exactly. wanted. Exactly. Now and comes a new government and says, that's not good enough for us. We want you to do different things. And how do you handle that uh, quality? Well, here's how you handle it. First of all, they didn't do what they said. They just put it off. Nothing was done. Shimon Peres particularly wanted to make it look like that. Said it was the greatest thing that's happened to, uh, to Israel, to Zionism in 100 years, and better than the state of Israel, I guess. They never did it. They just sent it over to a committee. And the proof of that is that when they got the Hebron Accord and made all of these, uh, again, promises again, sold the same rug all over again, that was one of the rugs they sold again. Now, had they done it, there'd be no point to put in the Hebron Accord, we're going to do what we already did. So, look, it, I don't, look, if you don't want to talk about reciprocity, then you, you want to talk about why uh, Bibi Netanyahu got elected. He got elected not because he said he'd be against the peace process, but because he was going to insist that it was a bilateral agreement and that they had to do what they promised. And that's why he got elected. If he had been against the peace, he would never have been elected. We know that. You know, we're not talking about a far-right fringe here group. I don't believe there's anybody in Israel, very few people, who don't want peace. The question is, are you really talking peace or are you simply talking a separation, another kind of separation? In that regard, I have to say that when you talk about the, the building of settlements, which is very minor right now, very little, nothing has been built in Har Homer, it's just trucks that are standing around there in Jerusalem. But the Arabs are building big time all over the West Bank and in Jerusalem, and illegally in most cases, without permits. And nobody wants to talk about that. They're building all over the place. So let's look at it that way, too. Why no, wait, all wait, wait, of this wait, wait. effort are, are to they, just blame Israel? Are they That's building right. on lands over which they have sovereignty? No, they don't oh, have okay. sovereignty over anything right now. They're building without permits and in Jerusalem and trying to make it a fait accompli that they're going to have a state with East Jerusalem as the capital. Remember this. Shimon Peres, all of them, and Rabin, assured everybody and the Israeli people and the Jews of the world that there wasn't going to be any Palestinian state. Now Peres comes out of the closet, and of course we knew he meant it to begin with. Look, I think the Oslo deal was flawed because the Palestinian Arabs are not ready for it. The propaganda is horrific that goes on, and you know that, Henry. Every day, every day, jihad and horrible anti-Semitic propaganda led by Arafat all the time. This doesn't stop. By the way, his army, which was supposed to be a very small little police force, is now up to about 40,000 people armed originally by Israel, and now a lot of arms are coming in all the time illegally. So. You know, it's, I don't, the way you, you, where you talk about it, the way the, the, uh, the, most of the American media now talks about it, you would think that the Palestinians are in total, you know, just poor Palestinians want only peace, and the Israeli, aggressive Israeli right-wingers, by the way, it's the only country in the world in which you're considered a right-winger if you don't want your son or daughter to be blown up on the way to school. What's that got to do with right-wing, you know? <laughs> well, Permit me to co uh, comment. Uh, yes. Uh, I have such great respect for Sidney that I never interrupt him. <laughs> um, first, with respect to this issue of building, you know, illegal Palestinian building, uh, the person who was in charge of housing the woman in Jerusalem mm -hmm. under Teddy Kollek and for a brief period under Ehud Olmert wrote a piece in a magazine called the Palestinian Journal, or the Journal of Palestinian Studies. This is the person who was in charge of policy and the implementation of policy, who said that the reason Palestinians build illegally is because they are not given permission to build. That's a that was the policy in Jerusalem, that you do not issue permits to the Palestinians. And there was no way under God's earth that they were able to build while Jewish housing, Jewish building, went on in a totally unrestricted way. Uh, so 
you know, we can get bogged down in these polemics, who struck who and who was worse and who was better, but it seems to me at any rate that there is a basic underlying problem that has very little to do with the question of reciprocity. And this is what Netanyahu really wants. I think the big difference between this government and the previous government is that the previous government decided not for reasons of uh, sainthood uh, or because, that, because Rabin is such a loving and giving person, but because he came to the conclusion that it's impossible for Israel to achieve security unless there is some normalization in the region, unless Israel makes peace first with the Palestinians, which is the condition for normalization with the rest of the Arab world, and that that is a security consideration at least as important as any other. That's his conclusion. So he did it not as a favor to the Palestinians, but because it served a critical Israeli interest, national interest. That's how he saw the situation. The, the big change is Netanyahu came in and he doesn't see it that way. He sees every inch that is given turned over to the Palestinians as a net loss for Israel. And he defines security in the narrowest of terms, and that's territory and military power. That's the big difference. Well, now, there, 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 there are two factual contradictions here. Let's just, just dispatch those. Uh, one has to do with whether it is correct to say that the Israeli government is satisfied with the anti-terrorist measures now being taken by Arafat. You say yes, you say no. no well, I, I know. I, 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 I don't say yes, if you mean. I said Netanyahu has not said yes. Netanyahu keeps no, but this criticizing this Arafat for not doing what he should right. be doing uh, to fight terrorism. But Mordechai, his defense minister, has said yes, yes. that he is doing it. The, the head of uh, the military intelligence has said yes. And the head of Shabak, the Secret Service, has said yes. They say better, but nobody says no, he's, no, de no, no. he's destroying not the infrastructure. Saying They're saying two things. They're saying, first of all, that in recent months, and particularly, incidentally, since this guy was assassinated uh, this, uh, recently, uh, Sharif, where he's really taken on the infrastructure as well, according to them. Uh, they, ins they say that. They also say one other important thing, which Prime Minister Netanyahu does not like to hear. But they say it to him and to his cabinet and for the record, that if Palestinians are told, no matter what you do, you will not achieve your most fundamental objectives, which is to say some form of Palestinian statehood, not only do the Palestinians have no incentive to fight terrorism, if they tried to do it, Arafat would be overthrown and that the two are linked inseparably. You must give them an incentive to fight terrorism well, and to incur the cost, because there is a cost, because it's an internal fight. It's a fight against other Palestinians. That's the big difference. Well, you know, if, if, you, if you just walked into this world, you'd think that when they did have assurances, very clear-cut assurances from Paris particularly, that there was going to be a state. He didn't have to say it right out there like that, but they knew that they were going to get one. They, they that is, the Arab Palestinians, uh -huh. that is when the worst terror took place. That's why he lost the election. Because with all of this That's giving true. that they did, That's true. it didn't stop any terrorism, it only increased it. So I'm not so sure that, you know, what, what you're saying here would come out to be true. However, if there is... Well, I'm not saying it. Well, I, yeah. I, I, well, I'm repeating. I know, but this, you what, know, guys on both sides, know I don't saying. think that Mordecai is the only uh, pl uh, military genius in the country. I think Arik Sharon is a guy who knows a little bit. I was just talking to him the other day. He said they've done nothing to destroy the infrastructure of terrorism. Now, you know, you can take it or leave it, but when it comes to <clears throat> security, <clears throat> I think Sharon is more believable and believed by the Israeli people when it comes to that. Now, he also pointed out that in this 13 percent picture that America wants, and all of it is so structured by numbers as if that's all you're talking about. It was all so automatic and so Western kind of oriented to think like that. But he, he shows you a map. They will have, Arafat will have control of the major water supply of Israel if you give them this. You can't let Arafat control that. What other country would do it? Start with this one too, Henry and Bill. No other country has ever given land for peace. So this has done a lot here. Nobody's ever done that. And not well, even for not peace, quite, not even not for correct. peace, just for promises, you know, that's and, and for correct. terror. What? Because water supplies throughout the world, you have riparian states and others have control over the same source of water. 
Uh, there, well, there are virtually very few countries that have total control over all of the water supply uh, in, within their geographic boundaries. But, but to there hand it over to do, Arafat would be a little wild, I think. Well, I don't know why you do it. That's the name of the game. Well, the name of the game the is to establish... Mr. Seaman, you, you, yeah. you, you've written that the terms currently rejected by Netanyahu would have been thought two years ago inconceivably good uh, in, terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of an Oslo uh, partition. It would have been inconceivable that the United States would endorse uh, a second withdrawal of 13%. Uh, 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 um, uh, Bibi Netanyahu has said and here I give him a great deal of credit. He said what he is about is to lower the expectations of the Palestinians. And I think he's done that brilliantly. Now, one would have thought in these circumstances that once he achieved this great victory where the US came down and said, yes, we support a minimal withdrawal of 13%, because the earlier understanding, quite correctly, uh, as you pointed out, uh, under Rabin and Paris was that he would get back most of the uh, West Bank. Uh, that was clearly understood. It was also clearly understood that a Palestinian state was not out of the question, that if he behaved, if the agreements were implemented, it would lead inevitably to Palestinian statehood. He has, Netanyahu has brilliantly turned all of this around. And instead of claiming victory and, and embracing the proposal, he painted it as some kind of a diktat that requires Israeli surrender. Well, it was irrational. You know, what, what I noticed, you're not, nobody's addressing that note for the record, the famous note for the record. This is America putting its name on the line and its honor and going right against what it promised it, only a year ago when they got Israel to move out of Hebron and the, called the Hebron Accords. Dennis Ross signed it for the United States government, guaranteeing that only Israel could decide its security and how much of a withdrawal and when it will make it. And it's not a subject for negotiation. And that was backed up with the Arabs, with nobody. They decide that. That was backed up by a letter from Christopher, when he was, uh, Warren Christopher, when he was Secretary of State. They passed right over that because it's a violation of the American honor and, and America's word. So every time Israel goes into a deal, everybody makes a big fuss about why. Oh, it was all over the papers. It was great. Reciprocity now from now on. And America signed on. It's our guarantee. Then they say, what are you bothering me with these legalities for? Can I ask you How a can question? you trust America then when you do that? Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. That same agreement to which you refer, the Hebron Agreement, the uh, note for the record mm -hmm. by, by um, Dennis Ross, and, and a statement by Christopher, all of which refer to the fact that Israel is to determine the size of its withdrawals, and as you said, quote unquote, not subject to any further negotiation. That same, all of those same agreements also provide that there must be a third redeployment, which Netanyahu has decided on his own he will not do. He said there will be only a second one. Why is it that you get exercised about this violation of agreement but have absolutely nothing to say about well, Netanyahu's violation well, because of, of what, another part of that same You don't get the third until you force second. But What's he has going said on that he will not agree to a second unless the Palestinians forego a third. That's a clear violation of that same agreement. Why oh, you come a, on, why Henry. Not? Because the violations were coming all one way. Now they try to force Sydney, him into Sydney, a second. Sydney, he says, wait. Sydney, oh, Sydney, come on, Henry is not a response. Thirteen. Oh, well. <laughs> I can respond, but this is... <laughs> then as we have only a, a minute to left. Uh, on the matter of statehood, you, you said that uh, unless there is some anticipation of that, all is vain. You say that it's, it's a, a violation of implicit protocols even to mention the fact Hillary Clinton's mentioning statehood eventually for Palestine shocked a lot of people. Was that proper for her to mention it? Was it, uh, uh, was it simply a lapse of protocol, or was it in fact not something that sh should have been thought of by the Clinton administration? Well, by, by way of background to my answer to that question, I should say that a year ago the Council on Foreign Relations issued a publication, a study, a task force report, uh, reassessing critically uh, U.S. policy in the Middle East. Its conclusion was that the Oslo Accord is getting nowhere, confidence building measures <coughs> no longer work, they have the opposite effect and that the only way to salvage the peace process is for the U.S. to take a clear position on Palestinian statehood and to say that is the goal of the process. The parties will negotiate the details, but that's the general framework. And short of that, the process will never be uh, revived. 
and all of these efforts are futile. Which takes me to your question. I think it was not appropriate for uh, Mrs. Clinton. Uh, for Mrs. Clinton to make that statement. It would have been appropriate for the President of the United States to make that statement. And he should have made that rather than ask his wife to make it for him. Uh, we have said all the time that peace will not come to the region unless the parties are ready to make hard decisions. But the U.S. must show that it too has a certain level of courage and prepared to, say, to take some domestic risks. And it's perfectly appropriate for a great power, which tells the rest of the world that we have a very special position as a great power, and that has interests that are profoundly affected in the region, national interests, at least to have a clear and public position on what it takes to move the peace process forward. Did the Democratic Party platform in 1996 on Israel acknowledge the possibility of a Palestinian state? No. No. No, the, no way. In no. fact, everybody no. campaigned the other way. And again, Absolutely. it's a joke. They always say that you know, we win, Israel wins all the exhibition games and the campaigns. These guys promise everything to get in. The Arabs take over. So what, and, uh, what number, no, do, do, do you reject that? The president that? of the United States is for a Palestinian state. I didn't mind Hillary saying it because I know that's what they want. I think he should say it if he wants it, but I'm very, it's a disgrace that he would say it. But it is true that that's what he wants, well, and that's what Indic and all those guys also? want. Oh, I think that to tell Israel you want a Palestinian state when the other side has done nothing to earn it one way and not at all, then you're saying what I said in the beginning. Oslo is dead, and all you're asking for is an unconditional withdrawal by Israel and, and establish a state on the West Bank. That's what you want. Thank you, Sidney so. Zion. Thank you, Henry Zygman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Next week on Firing Line, William F. Buckley Jr. talks with Patrick Glenn about his book, God, the Evidence. This program was a Warren Stiebel production in association with South Carolina ETV. Funding for Firing Line was made possible by a major grant from the John M. Olin Foundation, Incorporated, and the Friends of Firing Line. For information about a video cassette of this program, write to Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205 or called 803-799-3449. That's Firing Line, 2700 Cypress Street, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205, or call 803-799-3449.